Welcome. Today we are talking about the dreaded summer slide, what it is and how to prevent it. I am Sunny Sunlight's community and social media manager, but I'm also a Sunlight mom. I have been homeschooling my own children since preschool with Sunlight. And joining me today are some of our Sunlight mentors. So Lisa, you're at the top of my screen. Let's start. Do you want to share a little bit more about you? Sure. I'm Lisa. Um, I am a retired homeschool mom. I have three children, two of which I homeschooled exclusively with Sunlight. Um, one is now married and my other is finishing up her first year in college. And uh, I also travel to conventions to work in the Sunlight booth and enjoy meeting and encouraging moms there as well as on the app. Thank you for being here. Sheila, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I have three kids as well. I have boy, boy, girl. So like the opposite of Lisa, and we live in the same town as Lisa. So um, my three homeschooled, my oldest homeschooled through uh, beginning of high school. And then he went on to a private Christian school. The other two homeschooled all the way through and they are now out of college and working. I don't have any married ch children yet. And, um, and I too work as a mentor, a sunlight consultant, and um, I love sharing sunlight with new people. Well, great, thank you. Jonna, do you wanna tell us about yourself? Sure, I am Jonna Lawrence. I too work for Sunlight on their marketing and product development team. I go, I'm on the SEC team. I'm at conventions. I am also a soon-to-be veteran homeschool mom, Sunlight mom. My youngest of four graduates this year, and so I'm very excited to be joining the ranks of veteran. I have my oldest. He has graduated college as a nurse. The second one, she's graduated college and is a stay-at-home mom with a grandbaby. I love my grandbaby. And then my third one is a recently married, soon-to-be college graduate pilot. So very much in the depths of all the things. Well, thank you for being here as well. All right, ladies, so let's start by talking about what the summer slide is. How would we define that? And is it something to be concerned about? So I say the easiest way to describe a summer slide is when your children can't remember what they did last year because they took all summer off when you're trying to start the new year. So that's what we want to avoid to save us the exasperation and time coming in the fall. Perfect. Yeah, that's a great answer. So <laughs> um, should you worry about it when there are subjects like math that kind of review when you start back or, you know, there's certain areas where the beginning of the year is kind of a review anyway. Um, and if so, what are some ideas for retaining the information they learned last year or to continue learning through the summer months? So I think when we talk about math, that's usually the thing that people dread. Um, I don't think you need to do an hour of math every day during the summer, but I do think it is helpful and makes your start back to school less painful with less eye rolling tears flailing about on the floor. Not that I have personal experience with that. Um, if you do try to at least keep um, some math going, especially when they're little and you've just mastered your addition facts to give three months with absolutely no practice, you're setting yourself up, I think, for maybe not failure, but frustration, because that is a thing that that we do need to keep fresh in our brains. So I do think there is value in incorporating some things into your daily life, even in the summer. Perfect. So Lisa, you started a little bit with math. What are some ideas for math specifically for keeping those skills sharp all summer long? Well, I think um, Sunlight sells some great resources. Um, we have the Math Adventures workbooks, which are not like a math workbook. Um, it does do some fun math things. Um, Life of Fred is a fun way to see how math is incorporated throughout your real life. Um, as Fred encounters life, he has to do math. And then the Mathtacular DVDs, you know, you might pop that in the car DVD player when you're on a trip or 
um, you know, if it's a rainy day, it's not um, sitting at your desk doing a worksheet. It's humorous and something fun. So those are some resources that Sunlight has available. But, um, you know, you can do math at the grocery store. You can do math in the kitchen with baking or measuring or, you know, doubling a recipe, having a recipe. Um, so many ways that you can incorporate math. One thing we did um, when my daughter was probably between the summer of first kindergarten and first, maybe we had a um, 4th of July party that she sponsored, like she was in charge. So she used math to make a budget. She used math to stick to her budget. She used math as she made her recipes and snacks. And she used some other skills, which aren't math we'll talk about later, but that was a great way. It gave her a project and she was in charge of it. And she was learning and didn't even know it. So lots of ways you can incorporate math into day-to-day -day life. In our fa family, we followed a summer ske schedule. I had read a book, I think it's out of print. It's called San Sanity in the Summertime. Um, it was an old focus on the family book that I had heard about and uh, it, it gave you ideas on how you can um, have a summer ske schedule so that kids don't get bored and you can do fun things, um, but you can also have some time off. And so one of the things that we did was we would bake or cook once a week. We, we did all kinds of cool things like make pretzels and bagels and um, elephant ears and apple fritters and all kinds of stuff. Um, in fact, we had a, uh, we had an A to Z cookbook that, uh, gold medal flour put out like you know free if you just paper shipping kind of a thing and so we tried to cook our way through the alphabet there were some things that we didn't care about we skipped but um but that was really fun and so the kids didn't even know that they were lear learning measurements and you know they learned that three teaspoons equals a tablespoon and things like that so that was one thing that we did to incorporate math. Um, and then I think some of it is just connecting the dots for kids. When you're out in the store and you can talk about unit pricing and make them figure out which one's the better deal, you know, between the two kinds of bread or the cereal that looks like a good deal, but if you do the unit pricing, it's actually not. Um, and so teaching them those little tricks very casually, like you're not making a big deal out of it. You don't want to make it into a lesson because God forbid, you know, they have to learn something, but if you mention it casually, then they learn it very casually and, um, and it kind of keeps things fresh or you could play games. We had several board games, um, Muggins. That was another one that was on the flip side of that board. Um, can't remember it right now, but knockout or something. Knockout. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And so we would play some of those games, you know, they always wanted to play other games like Battleship, but I'd be like, let's play this one this time. I want to go. It's my turn to pick. And so, of course, I'd pick one that, you know, that one. Or I like to play bo Boggle because I'm more of a words girl. And um, and now nowadays we also have Bananagrams. Those are things that you can do to help with spelling, things like that. But I know we're talk talk talking about math, but those were some of the other games that we we would play. And you just can't Lisa, help yourself, can you? Got I can't, words. I can't bring the words help talking about words. <laughs> but Lisa has a lot of really good math games that you can play with cards um, or dice, and uh, and so you could also you know play play things like that. Just a FYI, Battleship is great in your graphing skills. Oh, yes, <laughs> See, that <laughs> is math. <laughs> <laughs> math and a little bit of history, learning about the, what a carrier is and what a map yeah. is and all of that. And I know you guys mentioned shopping. This is something that always comes up because my kids have birthdays that are very close to each other. And so they get all their gift cards and birthday money all at the same time. And so I like to let them pick out, you know, what they want within reason, but they have to figure out okay, how much is my $25 gift card going to cover? Would I rather have this or that? And don't forget about tax. And so that's kind of how they work on their math skills. And, you know, whenever in the summertime, oftentimes that's when grandparents come to town and they'll take them out for a treat. And we always tell our parents, okay, let them spend their money and, you know, help them with the math if they need it, but they, they love to take them shopping. So we like to do that 
where they're getting something fun. They don't really realize how much math they're using to do that. Um, and Sheila, you mentioned bananagrams and some of those word games. So let's talk about reading and writing. How do we keep those skills fresh in the summer as well? So one of our other days that we would do in our summer ske schedule was library day. And we would go once a week to the library and uh, check out books. Um, and our library has a reading program where kids can, you know, if they read a certain number of books a week, they can earn pri prizes. So we participated in that. And that was very motivational for my kids. They don't, it's funny, as much as I love to read and, and as much as we did sun, sun, sunlight, and so we used a literature-based curriculum, two of my three kids are dyslexic. So reading was never their first thing that they wanted to do, but they were motivated by the pri prizes. And um, we would also read aloud because I love to read and they're good stories. And so we would often explore authors that we discovered through sunlight. And so I remember the year we read um, the boxcar ch children in our curriculum, we mm -hmm. went and found all the boxcar children at the library and would read those in order, gotta be in order. Um, and then my son discovered Encyclopedia Brown. So he wanted to read all the Encyclopedia Brown books. And so that's another thing that you can do is just let your kids explore some of the books that they loved in the year and see if there are other books by the same author. Um, Andrew Clements was another author that we just fell in love with and read all his stuff. And he keeps write, writing. I'm, I'm behind. I need to go read more, more of his stuff. But um, so you can either read the same author or if it's part of a series just use your card catalog and see what what you can find that your library provides and if your library does not have a, pri a, a reward program you can create one you can say for every five books you get a star or you get a star for for every book you read and then x amount of stars you can cash in for different things and you know and Incentives really work. And so if you can find ways to make it fun and not make it a requirement, but we we would do what we called DEAR, D-E-A-R, and that stood stands for drop everything and read. And so we would have DEAR time at home. And that's when the kids would, would um, get their re reading in because that's all they were allowed to do, that or chores. So, you know, they're going to pick the re reading time over chores. So we didn't have deer time, we had squirt time. Ours was some quiet, uninterrupted reading time. And I would schedule it like a half hour every day when maybe the baby was close to nap time or was trying to give up nap, but that was our quiet time in the house, so. Yep, that was a lovely time in my life when that, my last one learned to read and cause we'd always had reading time but it always involved me reading to someone at some point. And then when the last one learned to actually read a book, you know, Magic Treehouse or the A to Z Mysteries, those great first reader chapter books. And I actually got to read. I promise there was like angels singing <laughs> in my house because we also had, um, we called it Dear, Drop Everything and Read. I think that's from um, Ramona. I think that's how I learned it. Okay. Uh, I think Ramona has that in her school. Um, and I could finally read for myself. And that was a timer I did cheat on. I'm big on timers and I say, don't cheat the timer. Um, but I'm pretty, pretty sure I cheated that timer. Just um, another thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> another thing that we did during the summer was a book club with our friends um, one summer we did the A to Z mysteries in the book club and they would meet and talk about it. So that was fun. And that was a little extra motivation for them to read. They did not want to not know what their friends were talking about. So that was fun. Um, and there was snacks and usually a little outside water time. It wasn't all books, but it was good motivation um, to get together and gave them a reason to need to read. So you could always organize a little book club um, as well. One of the, so in my past, not currently, I lived in a small town where my personal library was bigger than the public library. So really the summer readers that Sunlight Gives was a big asset. Um, I liked being able to order those for the kids and say, these are coming for summer when you're done. 
and we would pull the ones we didn't get to, like Sheila was talking about, and add them into our day. And um, another thing we did was the Chronicle of Narnia series. Like we took one summer and my husband read those to the kids at night. So a couple chapters every night. And that was our family reading time. So, yeah, yeah you know, I'm so the little spoiled house series. that is no schedule when you have to make your own read aloud so you don't <laughs> you just, have a schedule. Just read, read until your boat, if your voice goes away. That's your That's schedule. Right. Your limit is your voice. <laughs> that's when the kids the start jumping around and, and driving you crazy because you can always tell that too like okay this kid's done but but I love what you all said because you establish a culture of just reading all the time um it, I, all three of you said that that you read you're reading to your kids once they're old enough to read then they start reading on their own because then it is fun it doesn't feel like school necessarily it's just right. this is what we do as a family and I know I had one child who was very excited to read and loved going to the library and then another child who did not like that as well until I let him pick out his own books and sometimes they were way easier than what he could read or you know graphic novels and a lot of pictures and things like that but once he realized oh there's books out here I like it made all of his reading easier because I think before where he thought, oh, it's just words on a page, nothing to look at. I don't love this. He's my very creative child. So anything with pictures or anything like that, he just loves. Um, so we talked about reading. What about writing? I know oftentimes reading is easier for kids. Oftentimes it's more fun because you get to read a story somebody else wrote. But how do we practice writing and making sure that those skills stay sharp as well? Well, I'm actually going to advocate that re reading also helps your writing because you are reading good writing. And so you are you have a, a great example of what good writing looks like. So when you, you know, it's sort of like the whole computer thing, garbage in, gar garbage out. When you are inputting really good writing by reading it, then it just sort of absorbs into you and it becomes a part of you. But besides that... Um, Playing those word games um, is a great way to just keep vocabulary, spelling, those kinds of things active. Um, you could, we did not do this, but one thing you could do is to write letters to grandma. And, um, and you know, if you wanted to do like writing Wednesday and just pick a day and then you could recap your week. You can have each child recap their week, the things that you did. If you went to the beach, if you went to the mountains, if you went to the lake, if you went to the museum, if you went on any kind of trip or any kind of gathering with friends or whatever, you saw a movie, whatever, whatever it is, they can write grandma and tell her about it. Now, obviously, you have to have some buy in from grandma. She needs to be able to respond um, so that that conversation is a continuous thing. Um, but I, I know a lot of people have birthdays in the summer. My da daughter's birthday is in May. My son's is in August. So they can write thank you notes to the gifts that they receive. So that's another thing that they can write. I think you can also do a journal of your summer. Um, one year, actually got the idea from Sheila. My girls, I think even at Sheila's house, made a summer po uh, poster like a summer calendar and they did stickers and decorated it. And then um, I made them journal something. It was large, like it was two poster boards. So they had to write a sentence each day. If it was a beach day, they had to write some kind of sentence on the poster about a beach day. Um, but you could certainly just do a composition book, uh, like a diary or a journal. Um, I think sometimes kids are more, motivated to write if it's not going to be graded. So just a, a free writing kind of thing, recapping the day, a memory book. Um, that's a helpful thing for them. It's because writing really is communicating. And so we just want them to be able to organize their thoughts. And if you can just say three things that you loved about going to the beach or the lake or the wherever, you know, just getting your thoughts together and it doesn't have to be perfect and you're not going to grade their handwriting and their, all the things. And then, then they're a lot more willing to, to, to do that for us. Yeah. I think it's a gratitude journal, 
Like that would be great. When you said the three things, that's what made made me think of it. You know, if you wanted to keep a gratitude jur- journal, what are three things that you're thankful for today? Yeah. And you know, and and if you don't want to do it every day, then maybe five things that you're thankful for this week. You know, my new puppy, the beach trip, ice cream on Wednesday, whatever. I'm so living in Sheila. She got a new puppy, ice cream, and went to the beach. <laughs> That's quite the week. (laughs) If you have a real creative student doing one of those sketch journals where they draw the picture of their day or their week and write a couple sentences about it, but be as artistic as you want, but then write me a couple sentences underneath so that I know what it is when I look back in 10 years. And another is shopping list. When you're going to the grocery store or you're packing up your list to go to vacation, have your students, your kids write their list of what they're packing or what they're, we need to shop for. Let them do the writing. Another thing you can do is to sneak in a elective during the summer. You could teach typing during the summer. Um, if during the school year, you know, it's hard to add one more thing. If you add if you do keyboarding during the summertime, I, I taught my uh, my oldest son to type when he was in third grade because his handwriting was so bad and he really, 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 really hated to write. And I was really tired of taking his dictation in third grade when I thought, OK, by now you should be able to write, buddy. Um, once I taught him to type, he was much more prolific with his words because he wasn't trying to be as succinct as possible so that he could write the fewest amount of words as possible. So I did teach him to type very early and I was concerned. I mean, in this day and age with computers and now phones, but back then we didn't have, you know, phones quite as much. Um, Like my fear was that he was going to hunt and peck and I wanted him to learn how to type the correct way. So I did get him a typing program that Sunlight offers and, um, and he did that. And so once they know how to type, it's so much easier to get them to actually compose because it's not as painful. So that's another idea is that you could start a typing program like Typing Tutor, one of those things, and then they can type emails to grandma instead of handwriting them. Yeah, so many great ideas that you guys have shared. Let's talk about some of the other Sunlight resources that we have. I know we've talked a little bit about Summer Readers and Mathtacular, Life of Fred. What about our unit studies, hands-on projects, or maybe our travel guides? How can you incorporate those things into your summer so that your kids keep learning? So, well, travel guides, if you're traveling to those areas, they're great ways to add in school without them knowing they're doing school or actively doing school. Um, I was trying to think the unit studies, I would say I would add in a unit. Those are the great times to add in unit studies. So if you're, I mean, obviously you're not going to do the Lent study in the summer, but. (laughs) Or or Advent. (laughs) Or Advent. But maybe, you know, you might still want to pull those books and you still want to, if you didn't get to them, why not? Christmas in July. (laughs) (laughs) I think the lap books are great. Um, When I talk to moms at convention who are like, I can't add one more thing during the week. But if you just set aside, you know, two hours once a week or twice a week or whatnot and use it as a review of your year, um, making a lap book over the summer is a great way not to miss out on the resource, but also not to overwhelm you or your student. um, and still get to use that great resource and still have that awesome keepsake of your year. And it's, you know, you're cheating in a little bit of review there. So that's always good. And they have no summer slide when they do the lap book going into the fall. Yeah. Yeah. What a great idea. And if you did get like the hands-on history kit and you didn't get to all of the activities, pull that out and finish up the ones that you didn't get to and maybe re you know, remind the kids or have them tell you, tell me again what this catapult is for. What does it do? And, you know, see if they can remember what you read about when you were doing that level, when you were learning about catapults and um, yeah, it, it's a great way to review, but it's also a great way to use up the stuff that you bought with every good intention and then time life gets in the way and you didn't get to it. So it's, it's a, um, you've, you, you've already spent the money. You have it right there. Use it, use it. 
Yeah, I agree with that. We always have a few, whether it be like hands-on history or uh, science experiments or timeline figures or something that we didn't get to. Sometimes it's one read aloud. And so, yeah, we just stop our school year when we planned, but then we do those other activities throughout the summer and it doesn't feel as stressful or like we're trying to cram it in. And I do think the kids kind of, they have more fun and they get more out of it that way. So let's talk about kind of that passive learning or creating that lifestyle of learning. What is, oh, you know, some, or what are some ways that you can weave learning into your everyday life and maybe take advantage of, you know, camps that happen in the summer or museums or things like that as well? We love to go to the nature programs that our city has around town. Um, they had some in the summertime, but we we would just do them year year round. And the kids learn so much about animals and local plants and things like that. They could identify beautyberry bushes and the different kinds of um, butterflies that are around our town. Um, we planted a lot of butterfly friendly plants to attract butterflies. So you could do the butterfly unit study when it comes out and then um, and then plant some plants to invite butterflies into your yard. And, and you can talk all about the life cycle. I mean, there's just so much that you, you can do. Um, so much of it is just kind of keeping your eye open for different things. If you're somewhere and you see, you know, those brown signs that indicate some sort of historical marker or, you know, park or something like that, make, make a, you know, make a plan to go visit that, go check it out, go see what it's about. Um, read all the little details about things. Um, sometimes I would be more into it than the kids would. So sometimes I would absorb the information. And then again, very casually happen to mention, oh, did you know that? And, uh, and again, the kids would just be like, oh, no, I didn't know that. But it wasn't like, oh, kids, we're going to go over here and we're going to learn about Pedro Menendez or whatever. Um, so just, just keeping your eye open for things that are around you and being curious and being willing to learn. I think it's a great idea to spend a little time gathering just a list of things that are nearby day trips or short trips um, for rainy days or something like that. And then when you wake up and it's raining, you're not scrambling and people are thrashing about, I'm bored, there's nothing to do. Um, but you, if you just have a, a resource list of something, um, oh, well, you know what? We have these 15 things of rainy days. Let's pick one. And maybe then it is a bit more obvious that you're being educational, but maybe not. You know, it might still be a great robotics display at the local children's museum or something like that. So I think being a little proactive to have some things already in your arsenal is helpful. Um, but I do think, like Sheila said, there is, I love a brown sign, can hardly resist one. Um, <laughs> you know, it's just, and some of those things are, are the most fun that we've had because it was an unplanned day. We just set off seeing what we could see. And there might have been ice cream involved or, you know, something like that. But we still learned. And I think because we always homeschooled, in a way that sunlight promotes so well that it's a, a lifestyle of learning, not just school at home. So school really is never out. Um, we, we just want to raise lifelong learners and that's how you do it is by stopping at every brown sign that you have the opportunity to stop at. And when you show that you're curious, like you want to learn, you know, it's not like I'm trying to pour this information into you, but like you actually want to learn and you're not afraid to be a beginner. Like I, you know, one year I was like, I'm going to learn to knit and I learned to knit and it was messy, but I got better. And I wasn't afraid to be a beginner in front of my kids to show them that even adults don't know everything and we can learn new things. And so when you're willing to be that kind of person in front of your kids, you're modeling it for, for them. So it's not, oh, mom, you're trying to cram this information. It's like, no, this is mom and she wants to do these things and she's going to drag me along and we're going to learn it too, you know. So one thing that we haven't talked about is having your garden outside, adding in the science as well as 
some math and whatnot, but that's part of a lifestyle change for families. You know, they garden, they can, they plan for their summer. Um, and then and chickens. Oh yeah. And my chickens, I got chickens. How many eggs are you going to get? And will it sustain your family? And when is too much? So. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I know when I was growing up, anytime I asked a question about something, my dad, instead of answering the question, he would always say, well, what do you think? Let's find out more about that. And so he was encouraging me to research and kind of learn things. And then we would go to the library or, you know, now with the internet, it's a lot easier, but you can get online and watch videos about that thing or go find a place in your area about that thing. And so I find I do the same thing with my kids. If they have a question or an interest in something, well, let's go learn more about it. Let's go to that place or let's you know, watch videos of people in that place. This is something uh, that we started doing when we were learning about other countries is we find on YouTube videos that people have taken on their vacations just walking around and you get to see that place. You get to hear the languages spoken there, you know, if they're in like a busy area. And so it's just kind of a fun way to learn about places that you may not get a chance to go to. Um, but, but yeah, just looking for those opportunities when your kids ask something or if you're in a new place to kind of explain it to them, they're learning without realizing it. And then Lisa and Sheila, like you guys said, not being afraid to show them that you're willing to learn and try new things too. You know, if you're interested in a new hobby, take that up. If you want to learn to make a new recipe, do it together as a family, you know, anything like that is something where you're encouraging them to learn. And then you have less of that slide, I think, because they're learning constantly. Um, but there are some people that choose to homeschool year round to prevent this. So can you ladies talk about what scheduling like that looks like? Um, because it sounds very overwhelming when you think about homeschooling all year long. And um, so how might you modify your schedule to do that, you know, in a way that prevents kids from regressing at all? I think a lot of people just determine a schedule, whether it's four weeks on and one week off or six weeks on and two weeks off or something like that. We did homeschool year round when my kids were smaller. Um, we live in Florida. It's often 110 by 10 in the morning and no real person wants to be out there. Um, but our motto was always we were going to do school unless something better came along. So if someone called and said, hey, do you want to go to the beach or do you want to come over and swim or run away to Siberia where it's not 110 degrees? You know, we were always up for that. Um, we never said, oh, no, we can't. We have school. But um, and it wasn't a full day. We might only read history this day or tomorrow. We might only do our read aloud or whatnot. Um, but you certainly can just alternate your schedule. Um, another thing is we like to be off when, uh, you know, um, Sheila and I, April and May are the best months ever to be at the beach because the school kids are still in school. It's only 90 degrees. So we don't want to be doing school at that time. Not humid we yet. Can it, we can do it in July when no true Floridian is going to be found anywhere in Florida in the outdoors. Um, you know, then that's good too. So I think just whatever your schedule is, if you live in a place that winter is especially wonderful for you, you know, schooling in the summer might be the thing. Um, so just establishing a schedule, that's the beauty of homeschooling is that it's so flexible and you can make it work however works best for you. My parents live overseas and so we would often go visit them and we would pack up our some of our school school books and go, but we had the flexibility of traveling when it was the off se season and the flights were cheaper and kids, you know, were in school. And so we could pack up and go. But that meant that there were times where we had to do school in the non-traditional school time. So we might start school at the very beginning of August because by then we were tired of the beach and tired of the sand and all the activities that I had planned and the new books were on the shelf calling my name. And I knew we were going to take three, three weeks off in October to go visit the grandparents. So if we get a jump start now, then we don't have to bring books. And um, so again, it's very flexible. A traditional school year is 36 weeks. 
and you can break it up however you want, but you can also stretch it out and, and slow it down. Um, you know, it's, it's just, it's just a matter of making progress. I have, I've taught in a um, co-op class before, and I did have a student who skipped just about every class and did not learn. And that, and, and that was to the mother, you know, I faulted the mother because they went to Disney every Friday. And so they weren't in co-op. And so he wasn't writing a paper for my class. Um, so you can't always play. You have to do school. <laughs> you have to put it in. Um, but being flexible is part of the joy of homeschooling. So it's a balance of getting the work done, but also being allowed to, to play on beautiful days. Sometimes it's a mindset in moms that they don't have to stay on the school, the public school schedule just because they're in session doesn't mean you have to be in session. And just because they're on break doesn't mean you have to be on break. We've always taken from before Thanksgiving till the second week of January off to have all the Christmas time because there's just so much going on. It wasn't totally not school, but it was definitely very relaxed. And come spring when it calls, I'm outside. I would rather be outside. And I live in Alabama where they have terms for the summer, but it's just really hot. And so um, I, mid end of January, July, I'm often saying, okay, well, why don't we pick up? Let's start getting going. So we'll, we start slow, but yeah. A few days but I Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I love how you guys are saying about the heat because living in Colorado, I'm the opposite. I We do have, of course, great winter activities here, but I don't like the cold. And so in the summer, I want to be whitewater rafting and hiking and on my paddleboard and in our camper and doing all the summer things. So we do usually try to take a summer break. But Jonna, like you said, starting with maybe two or three days a week, we usually do that when we're easing back into school. So we might start like a read aloud at the end of July, early August, um, or maybe the history book or, you know, because I love history. That's my favorite subject. And so, you know, we might start with a few things, but not charge in with the full year until school's back in session. Um, and then what you said about you might be doing school when other kids are on break, that's something we've always done with spring break. To me, there's no point in taking spring break if we can get done a week earlier in the year. And so that this year was a little bit harder for my kids when they would see their friends out playing. But I just reminded them, well, you can get your schoolwork done earlier in the day and then you can still go play with your friends, you know, that are home. And then next week or the week after when we go somewhere, we don't have to worry about doing school as much. So yeah, like Sheila, to your point about making sure you're doing something and staying on track, but you can change your schedule to whatever it needs to be. Uh, do you guys have anything else to add before we wrap up? I was just gonna point out on our snow days, when the local schools was on snow days, I let my kids go play. And then when everyone wanted to be in for hot chocolate, then we did school. So we still had a school day and a snow day. And a snow day. <laughs> My kids have never had a snow day. We don't get snow days. Uh -uh. We get hurricane days. Hurricane but it's, days. But it's in the summertime <laughs> usually. September, but yeah. But hey, we have tornado hurricane days. Day is an awesome day to get some read aloud stuff done. Because yeah. <laughs> you don't want to move because the air is out. Yeah, it's right. hot. Ooh, yeah. And <laughs> can't watch TV, there's no power, and you certainly can't go outside. So it is a great way to get some read alouds in. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, ladies, for joining me. As always, you bring so many great ideas to the table. And for anybody who's watching, if you need help figuring out your specific situation, definitely post those questions in our Sunlight app. We are all in there, and we would love to answer them for you. Absolutely.